Good morning and thank you for waiting. Welcome to the conference call to discuss Banco Santander Brasil SA's results. Present here are Mr. Angel Santo Domingo, Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. André Parisi, Head of Investor Relations. All the participants will be on a listen-only mode during the presentation, after which we'll begin the question and answer session, when further instructions will be provided. If you need any assistance during the presentation, please call the operator by pressing star zero. The live webcast of this call is available at Banco Santander's Investors Relation website at www.santander.com.br ri, where the presentation is also available for download. We would like to inform that questions received via webcast will have answering priority. If you wish to ask a question via phone, please press star 1. Once your query is answered, press star 2 to leave the line. Each participant is entitled to ask one question. If any further information is required, please re-enter the line. Before proceeding, we wish to clarify that forward-looking statements may be made during the conference call relating to the business outlook of Banco Santander Brasil operating and financial projections and targets based on the beliefs and assumptions of the executive board as well as information currently available. Such forward-looking statements are not a guarantee of performance. They involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions as they refer to future events and hence depend on circumstances that may or may not occur. Investors must be aware that general economic conditions, industry conditions, and other operational factors may affect the future performance of Banco Santander Brasil and may cause actual results to substantially differ from those in the forward-looking statements. I will now pass the word to Mr. André Parisi. Please, Mr. Parisi, you may proceed. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our earnings conference call. 2020 was a challenging year more than usual. And we also had important achievements, which will be presented today by our CFO, Mr. Angel Santo Domingo, as well more details on our fourth quarter and full year results. So now I turn it over to Mr. Angel. Fourth Q results, Santander Brazil's uh, fourth Q results. Um, uh, we have divided the, the presentation uh, in the four areas, uh, basically in a strategic update, uh, the main highlights of the results, um, Santander uh, group results, and the final remarks. Um, starting with the first uh, part, what I would like to do is speak a little bit, just a little bit of how we finalized 2020. As Andres said, yeah, it's not been in a, a normal year, let me say it like that, uh, and then we will probably speak more about um, forecasting and uh, forward-looking ideas. So in, in the first slide, as you can see, we made a summary of what we have been achieving during the last years, but specifically what we have been um, delivering uh, during these uh, four uh, queues uh, in 2020. Uh, it is um, a fact that commercial activity and transactionality has started to rebound uh, during the second uh, queue. But it also, I think it is important to notice or to underline that in fourth queue, there were three key ideas which do uh, leverage us thinking in 2021. First one is that production, as you will see, uh, improved and started to get uh, the good speed and direction. Uh, the second point is that even uh, we, in, in that situation, the attendance, the quality of attendance, the MPS, hit um, a record high. Uh, and we, I will present that uh, further on. And the third one is that, as you will probably see, credit quality is absolutely uh, controlled uh, with a good uh, and nice uh, trend. So uh, moving uh, to be a little bit more concrete in next slide, um, uh, we have uh, presented in terms of uh, NII growth and cost evolution, uh, good numbers. Uh, NII grew 7% year on year. Uh, we have an efficiency ratio of 37% in, in 2020 in the, in the year, closing the year in 39%. As you know, we have some seasonality in the fourth queue, uh, which are so far, but we can estimate that they will be uh, the, the best efficiency numbers in the country. Uh, this has been the case during the last quarters, and uh, we may 
say that it could happen also in this queue. In terms of net profit, after deducting the extraordinary provisions we made in second queue, we have achieved 13.8 billion, and that includes net of taxes, 2.7 billion of this extraordinary uh, provision. Uh, that leads us to almost uh, double the market share in net profit compared to our natural market share. Return on equity remains in, in, in good levels. Extracting the extraordinary provisioning, we are in 21.5%. Uh, if we include that extraordinary, we go down to 19%. Uh, 19%. Um, you have in the, in, the, in the last part of the slide uh, achievements and recognition uh, that we have re recognitions that we have received throughout the, the year. I would like to underline in, in between all of them uh, those that uh, were not known or are new. Uh, in Euromoney, we received the award as the best bank in Latin, Amer in Latin America and the world uh, for SMEs, and the best company in social responsibility by CNN and uh, institutional investor as the most honored bank in Latin America. Uh, moving to the uh, next slide, uh, what I would say is that we keep on gaining market share, both on the asset and on the liability side, as you may see. Uh, collateralized loans keep on growing, 400 basis points more on a year-on-year -year basis, so we keep on uh, shifting or increasing the, the lower risk profile of our individual loan portfolio. And in the bottom of the slide, you have different uh, kind of examples of uh, these um, collateralized loans, how they are evolving. No? I would say strong growth in all of them and specifically gaining a strong mar uh, market sales. No? Um, and all this happens with, as I said in my beginning words, or my introductory words, with a rigorous risk um, situation. Um, it is important to understand on the risk side not only the total kind of quality of the portfolio, but also what is happening with recoveries. I think we have developed and we are delivering a, quite a positive and good recovery capacity. As you may see there, we are growing 26%. Uh, year on year uh, uh, compared to 2019, but it has also evolved in quality in terms of, for example, 70% uh, are done in, uh, in digital uh, channels. No? So this leads us to the to what uh, to the reach to the sorry to the graph that you have on the right side, which is basically that we tend to be less volatile than our competitors. So the standard deviation of our kind of performance in cost of risk tends to be more stable, less uh, cyclical, let me say, like, like that. No? And this is a strongly part due to the uh, recovery capacity. You will see numbers in, in a few moments. Uh, and and uh, trying to in the next slide, trying to, to build what is, I would say, a, a simpler uh, bank, uh, there are multiple kind of fronts in which we are working. We just put here some of them. Obviously, customer support, um, uh, automating operations and processes. This has been a key uh, kind of uh, issue for us in the last years, not only in, in 2020. And in technology, obviously improving the end-to-end -end, uh, lending. No? And all these leads... To, uh, to improve our cost uh, side, no? because we increase the number of products that are in digital channels, uh, because uh, we incre increase the productivity of our stores, or because uh, we are more uh, environmental friendly and responsibility, also saving, saving costs. No? As you know, focus on unit cost is also key to understand our, our evolution. And diversity in the next slide, uh, we couldn't forget about this. Uh, we continue to improve numbers, as you can see there. We have already 25% of our employees are black. 29% of our leadership uh, is our women, et cetera, as you can uh, see there, diversity. We have ambition plans here, and you will see our evolution in, in next quarters and, 
and years. No, we have been recognized by the market as the best uh, company to work for in the, in the different uh, rankings. We have a very high engagement that remains very high, very important for us to have that 92% of engagement. And our uh, and the, the positioning of the bank uh, can be reflected, for example, in our trainee program. No, I mean we had more than 70,000 trainees applications received. Uh, if we compare this with just a couple of years ago, three years ago, we were around 10,000 or even below that. No? So uh, clearly the attraction of the bank for also young talent is happening. Uh, moving to the uh, sustainability uh, arguments, uh, in the first slide of, of this item, uh, we have been, we have continued to be close to to the society. You know, we have impacted, we calculate around 300, 270 uh, thousand people with the different supporting uh, supporting programs. Amigo de Valor, as you know, one of the main Brazilian social programs, uh, which is focused in uh, children and teenagers, uh, has also had outstanding results. Uh, our initiatives last year included uh, granting scholarships, um, and during the COVID, uh, we promoted things like Semana Santander, uh, specific, specifically focused on CUFA, which are uh, communities in need, or the distribution of uh, uh, almost 20 million masks, or uh, the donation of uh, 100 plus million reais. No? On the second slide of sustainability, what uh, we try to put there is how we are uh, leading or participating in this business. Um, and this is the, from the business point of view. Um, you can see their numbers in terms of green bonds um, to solar energy financing, promoting uh, or pioneering sustainable credit lines, uh, social responsible investments, uh, such as our ethical fund and the Santander Go Fund, uh, and doing with the main private banks, I already mentioned this to you in, in previous results, the Plano Amazonia, uh, clearly focus on that uh, on that uh, region. In total, 27 billion of ESG business that we have done with uh, with the market. So, closing the first part of this uh, kind of a strategy update, um, let me update in a couple of slides what our and those planets that I presented to you some time ago, uh, in between one year, one year and a half ago, how they are evolving and, and what is happening. Uh, to them. No? In the first slide, you have four of them. MDIA, which is our uh, debt re renegotiation platform, already reaching 4 million customers. Santander Auto, uh, a, a great success of our insurance uh, initiative, uh, already surpassed, surpassed 100 million premiums in the first year. This is the first insurance company to achieve that mark, obviously putting things in the same time in perspective. Toro, uh, the merger with P that we are expecting uh, central bank approval in the very short term. And uh, Ben, uh, our um, uh, platform for, for vouchers that already reached, I don't know, 1.4 uh, human resources departments or uh, almost 340,000 uh, merchants. And on the second slide of this uh, small part, I underline there both SIM and our consumer finance uh, unit. No? To underline about SIM that continues to grow fast and strong, already a portfolio today is clearly over that, but I mean at the closing 700 million um, reais, it's already in profits, so uh, it already gone, has gone through break even. Uh, production is heading towards 100 million reais per month. Uh, and then you have Santander Financiamentos, the consumer finance part of, of our business that keeps growing, uh, improving the micro regionalization business, uh, both in B2B and uh, B2C. B2C sorry. Uh, and we are clearly increasing activity with the market, aiming to grow our portfolio strongly, almost at 50%, as you may see there, uh, on, a, on, a yearly, on a yearly basis. In the last part, if I may go in the last part of this initial introductory uh, words, which is growth. Okay, so uh, customer-wise, uh, which is the first slide, 
as you can see, we have continued to grow strongly our uh, customer buy, uh, base. We have almost 28 million active clients, 6 million loyal, and 16 million digital, with nice growth rates in all of them. I would underline specifically the loyal ones are still growing or continue to grow in a double digit, 12%, um, on a year on year. The MPS, I introduced to you that we were performing nicely there, 63 basis points. We started with almost, when we started to publish the number, we were close to 40. Uh, we, as if you remember, we spent some quarters around the 55 to 57 points, and now we have improved to uh, clearly above 60, 63 points. That is almost eight points uh, improvement in 12 months. So we are clearly in the line of improving our capacity and our quality of attendance, which is one of our key strategic lines. No? And on the digital uh, agenda, I just wanted to, to underline, we just wanted to underline to you the, this gente, or gente, which is our uh, artificial intelligence uh, in initiative to support uh, the commercial expansion and the commercial activity in our, uh, with our clients. So, uh, as you can see, almost 40 million interactions already, 70% uh, coverage, etc. Um, moving to the payments industry, which, as you know, is, is kind of one of the focuses of the of the market, uh, we, tr we try to, to put some numbers here to kind of uh, focus on how strongly we, we are growing uh, here. No? So, as you may see there, turnover growing above 40%, uh, probably, if not the strongest, one of the strongest in the, in the market. Um, with a strong participation of our uh, current account holders or of our uh, more loyal clients, let me say it like that, um, and, uh, and we issued on the on the back of the PIX new payment system, we issued also the, the card SX, which is the, the, the merchandising or the commercial no, um, name we gave to our PIX initiative. Uh, and as you may see, also uh, quite good growth there. No? So we have grown since the start of the peaks, which was in November. We have sold more than 1 million cards of X, of S cheese in this, up to today. This is not up to the closing of the year. This is up to today. Uh, so it's close to two months, a little bit more than, than two months. Okay. Uh, and the numbers on the peaks system also on your right. Uh, you can see there that we have 15% market share, so uh, clearly above also our, uh, what we could call the natural market share with a strong activity and transactionality. On the GetNet side, linked to these payments uh, kind of um, universe, uh, you may see there the, the, the main numbers. I would underline market share. We have transformed um, uh, uh, what was a fintech eh, in a 15% market share a player, strong, gaining a strong market share continuously, 25% market share in, uh, in e-commerce. Uh, turnover continues to grow well above the market, and the prepayment of receivables increased almost 40%, 39% in a yearly basis. And not uh, last but not least, uh, we have the lowest cost per transaction, which is constantly evolving. You may see there... The average cost 2020, 0.32 reals per transaction. In fourth queue was 27, and in December was 23. So the evolution uh, continues to be in the right direction of being able to have the lowest cost of transactions on being quite competitive. This compares very nicely with any number you may see in the market. And finally, to end this kind of uh, this uh, part of the presentation. Uh, what uh, we could uh, speak about our corporate or company's bank. No, uh, We have been achieving different leaderships and different uh, presences in, the, uh, in products. Uh, I will underline that uh, we have had more than uh, $270 billion in project investments. We are top five in energy trading. We were named the best bank for Forex pioneers in fully digital forex contracting as you know we offer the one pay forex uh, which uh, is already with uh, important transactionality 
Okay, so as I said, uh, these were the, the, the main kind of un, uh, highlights that I wanted to share with you of what has been 2020, uh, 20, but specifically how we end the year and how we go into 2021. And now let me go into the proper numbers, which is uh, what uh, we uh, may see. The, the, the first slide is the numbers of uh, the group. Uh, that this has already been presented. Uh, we, I'm not going to elaborate too much there. Just underline that we continue to be approx one third, thirty percent of of the profits. The region is the region, meaning the region of South America is achieving forty two percent of weight uh, on the results. Details have already been given by the group. Uh, moving to our results uh, on the slide, I think it's twenty three. We present full details there. We close the quarter with net income close to four billion, uh, three nine fifty eight, a one point four increase on our Q on Q basis. Uh, and for the full year, I already mentioned we reached thirteen point eight billion, or and this is important, fifteen point six billion before the extraordinary provision we made in second Q. Uh, I would call uh, this a sound result, considering the year we have just finalized. Uh, highlighting the same, the, the next, uh, the following figures: on the revenue front, NII remained virtually flat relative to third Q, while in the full year increased almost 7%, reflecting a good evolution of our loan portfolio and market activity results, offsetting pressures, as you, pressure as you may see uh, afterwards on the spread side. Fees, on the other hand, decreased 1.2% in the year, impacted by a lower transactionality, obviously, uh, during the pandemic. In the quarter. We already had a solid increase of 8%, more than 8%. Here, both the client base growth, the higher activity driven by better economic activity, played a key role in the second half of the year. And on the expenses side, provisions remain under control, declining even 1.2% in the quarter and increasing 4%, 3.8% in the full year compared to 2019. And general expenses, once again, under control, growing clearly below inflation on a yearly basis, and below revenue growth, thus improving our operating leverage in the PNL. Such performance comes as a result of the key pillars that I have already said with you some other times, which is constant client base expansion, leading to a solid and sustainable growth, accurate risk models, and intense effort on cost control. Here we have a, a clear agenda uh, leading to uh, lean growth and productivity gains. So now if we start by the different parts of the PNL and AI, um, totaled 1.2, sorry, 51.1 billion uh, in uh, last year, as I said, increasing 7% uh, compared to previous one. Client and AI increased 1.1% in the quarter and remained virtually flat in the full year, with uh, product and AI benefiting from a positive volume dynamic, which you will see in the next slide. This effect more than compensated both mix and spread reduction, as I already mentioned uh, before. Working capital delivered weaker results in a yearly basis, given obviously that we have a, a lower CELIC. And NII from market activity presented a good performance in 2020. 2020. In the quarter, we presented a softer and more probably normalized level. In the next slide, we can see that our loan portfolio reached 412 billion reais by the end of the fourth quarter, representing a growth of 4% QMQ, uh, quarter on quarter, 4%, and 17%, as you may see there, uh, on, uh, in the year. Uh, a strong performance, I would say, versus the, the system, the financial system. Individuals and consumer finance accelerated the pace, as I mentioned in my introductory words, of growth in the quarter, growing 6 and 4% respectively, reflecting this pickup in demand, for example, for vehicles. And interesting also to note, if you can see in the slide, that the SME portfolio experienced a solid quarter and quarter growth, uh, as you may see there, close to 5%, which is a continuation of what we saw or we started to see in third queue. Finally, let me quickly underscore that 76%, uh, I already said this number, but I want to repeat it, of the individual's loan book is comprised of collateralized loans. 
In slide 26, uh, as uh, we have been doing the last uh, three quarters now, uh, we update our deferred loan portfolio. It totaled 40.6 billion reais, indicating a decrease of roughly 9 billion since it was created in the second quarter. Remember that we started with almost 50 billion. Important to underline that the portfolio moratoria has already expired, so what I mean by this is that we are already in a have to pay mood. I mean, everything is, yeah, is at, at, uh, at current status. Uh, the 15 to 90 days MPL in, in this portfolio reached 5.5%, showing that even with the reduction in the liquidity support paid by the, the government and the moratoriums, our early delinquency still remains at, hel at healthy and comparable levels. It is important to stress that more than 50% of uh, this individual's portfolio is collateralized with more than 85 of the loans rated in between AA and C, which are the central bank ratings, the better central bank ratings, risk ratings. Uh, on the funding side, on slide 27, you will notice that our funding maintained strong trends, especially in the main client own balance lines. If we include all funding from clients, it was almost as stable in the quarter and grows uh, close to 30%, 29% year on year. All concepts presented a positive performance in the year, except the most expensive instrument, financial bills, letras financieras, a trend that we have executed during several quarters already. This dynamic is in line with our study of lowering the funding cost, and in our view, the current level is adequate to support, the current level of growth, obviously, is uh, adequate to support our loan growth, as you can see comparing growth rates of both the funding and the asset side. Moving to fees, you may see how a strong transactionality came back as soon as economy started to recover, with an 8% increase in QEQ, clearly giving an, an idea of how transactionality in the bank is, is working. Highlights, I would say cards, which presented 14% Q and Q growth, with an increase in transactionality and, turn, and total turnover. Current account, that increased even on the, on the back of the peaks launched, reflecting a larger client base. And finally, insurance, which, uh, as you know, we have always some seasonality here in the fourth queue. It grew close to 22%. If we clean the seasonality, it is growing at a 3%. Moving to the quality part of the presentation, uh, as an overall, quality remained at very sound levels with a high coverage ratio, thus reflecting a solid balance sheet. Short-term MPL presented a slight improvement, as expected given the end year seasonality. And the 90 days MPL maintained a good and comfortable level, this 2.1% that you may see on the slide. Uh, the already mentioned almost 300, 297 percent coverage ratio combined with the good performance of the deferred loan portfolio that I already mentioned also, uh, sustain our view that the level of extraordinary provisions done is adequate. Um, on the on next slide, you may see uh, that loan loss provisions remain controlled in the year, reflecting a cost of credit of 2.8 percent in the year, 2.5 in the quarter. Uh, the 2.8 obviously does not consider the extraordinary provision we made in second queue. It would be 3.6 if we include it. In the uh, full year comparison, provision in expenses grew 77.2%, while at the same time loan portfolio expanded 17%. This is the reason why cost of risk obviously has, has uh, decreased. No? Uh, and this also reflects the collateralized portfolio I, I was giving to you in numbers. Finally, it is important to highlight in last year that we presented the best level of recovery of write-off uh, loans, uh, which increased by 26% I mentioned. Uh, just look at the, at the red part in the, in the right side of the slide, in which you may see that the 2.2 billion of recoveries done in 2019 have moved to 2.8 billion in uh, last year. So an improvement of uh, 600 million approximately or almost one-third, no? Okay, uh, in terms of costs, uh, fourth Q posted again ex an excellent performance, I think, decreasing 2% year-on-year. Uh, 
the the three percent quarterly increase, as I mentioned, is uh, the traditional end of year seasonality. No? If we overall we see full 2020 cost, they grew one percent, clearly below inflation. Remember that inflation closed the year at 4.4 percent, 4.4 percent, so more than 300 basis points below inflation, and that is one of the reasons, other reason why uh, the efficiency ratio improved. Uh, this efficiency ratio reached the 38.8% I mentioned in fourth Q and 37% full year. Uh, and also we uh, discontinued our guidance given one year and a, and a half ago. Uh, it is already a better efficiency level than the one we forecasted for 2022. No? So we are already achieving more than, than expected. Uh, finalizing the presentation in the last uh, two, three slides, Capital and liquidity, we continue to have comfortable lab, uh, numbers and levels to face the scenario we have in front of us and to uh, specifically to support growth. Our funding in terms of loan to deposit ratio is around 90%, as you may see. Uh, so it's a good improvement both uh, on the quarter and specifically in the year. And at the end of the year, our BIS ratio reached 15, a little bit more than 15%, and our core equity tier one. Uh, last year, finalized the year at 12.9%, uh, uh, remembering that our reference level continues to be around 12%. Uh, and moving to indicators, the last part of the numbers, uh, they all um, show good evolution uh, in a year-on-year -year comparis comparison. Efficiency improved 180 basis points to the mentioned 37%. Uh, we estimate, uh, as I said, that the could continue to be the best ratio in the industry. Recurrence ratio reached good level, recovering from what we saw last year, given the, the, commission, uh, the commission's stress we had in some quarter, uh, to a level of 86%. And our profitability remains at healthy levels, uh, even if we compare, I'm sorry, if we include the extraordinary provisions that I mentioned. So, uh, Concluding my part uh, in terms of presentation, I would like to highlight that first, our commitment continues to be obviously to support our customers, employees, and society, as you may see throughout the presentation, while delivering uh, good profitability uh, to our shareholders. We rely on, we think we rely on a strong business model supported by the engagement of our employees, assertive perception of business cycles and a continued efficiency effort, a solid combination that has allowed us to reach and capture market opportunities in advance. So this is it. I would like to thank everybody for the attention. And now, Andre, I think we are available to answer your questions. Thank you. We're going to start the Q&A uh, with the questions we received through the webcast. So the first one is uh, from uh, Eduardo Hosman, BTG Pactual. Regarding your future ROE at Santander Brazil First Investor Day at the end of 19, it was guided a ROE of close to 21% for the end of 22. Due to COVID-19, the guidance was canceled, but, it's still, but you still report ROE of 20% in four quarter. Do you think it is possible to deliver ROEs close or slightly above the 20% mark in the next three years? And here we have an, uh, another question with the same subject from uh, Thiago Batista, UBS. Santander Spain provide a medium-term guidance for ROTE for South America of 19 to 21%, and Brazil is the main business of the region. Do you believe this level of profitability is feasible for the Brazilian operation? Okay, sorry. I think we were put on on mute, and we were having. I was elaborating on the question, and uh, no, uh, but the the question I think it was heard, Andre. I'm sorry about this. Uh, I was speaking, and and uh, we were on mute. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat the answer I just gave, without anybody hearing me. Uh, so thank you, Eduardo and Tiago. Uh, let me try to answer your question. Uh, you are right in terms of the return on equity. We di we discontinued. The, uh, the guidance, we do not have a guidance right now. The clearly objective of the 
um, of the bank is to maintain utilizing the capital in the right way, and this is a continuous kind of discussion on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, so profitability is going to continue to be uh, the main uh, kind of uh, objective or one of the main objectives. Uh, we have already achieved levels of that guidance that was uh, discontinued. I already spoke about efficiency. We are better than that. We maintain profitability around the same levels, the 21%, uh, 20%, and we will continue to try to deliver on that sense. So uh, that is no question. Now, uh, we, will, we are obviously discussing about the guidance, if we re resume it or not, and what is the best moment to do that, and we will uh, come to you as soon as that discussion is finalized. But uh, the, 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 we strive to continue delivering levels of profitability that the market will pay for. I'm sorry about the mute thing. Okay, next question is from uh, Vitor Schabel of Bradesco BB. When does the bank CNPR ratio peak in? How does it should affect provisioning trends ahead after declining in the fourth quarter? Um, well, uh, the reality is that both MPL, cost of risk, quality in general terms, as you have seen in the in the slides, uh, has performed uh, positively. That is that is a fact. So we are currently with with rate with ratios, both in terms of cost of risk and in terms of um, of MPL, both the uh, 15 to 90 days. Um, really, really quite attractive. No? We are speaking of two, around 2% 2 the over 90 and in 2.5% the, um, the cost of risk. Now, I think we have two discussions here. One is the short term. The short term, uh, if uh, we see how the economy may evolve, what the supporting measures, how the supporting measures and liquidity measures to the individuals are happening and the evolution of them and how we may see the next months, and I'm speaking of months, um, we may see that the trend is marginally, slightly, let me underline the marginally and slightly, but with some deterioration. Uh, we, are we seeing that as of today? The answer is no. But, uh, again, if I apply some rationality to the, to the situation, I would say that, the, that those levels that I mentioned uh, in MPL and cost of risk uh, would probably tend uh, upwards. Uh, we are not seeing any leading indicator in that sense. We are not, as you know, we follow all kind of, of ratios. Now, looking a little bit farther, so not only in the next uh, months, or um, what I would still see is that if Brazil goes into a more stable and reform-wise country where you start to continue to have more collateralized loans, as I have showed to you, you continue to have a more stable environment, my guess is that structurally cost of risk will be better. But that is a long-term view. Okay? So we probably go through a short-term small deterioration, um, that could be happening, I don't know, during, we are not seeing as of now, so I don't know if it's first queue, first semester, depending on, on how things evolve here in Brazil on a macroeconomic uh, point of view, and then probably move into a more positive uh, standpoint. Okay, next question is from uh, Pedro Leduc, Itaú BBA. P revenues from current account were better than resilient, up plus 3.5% quarter on quarter, and you are one of the first that is slash fastest adopters of peaks. Can you elaborate on how you achieve this between volumes, pricing, and what is fair to assume growth in line in final year 21 as well? Okay, a couple of, of comments here. Uh, you're right, insurance grew 22% on the quarter. Remember, I mentioned this during my, my presentation, that we have seasonality here every fourth quarter. So that means that we have an income from an insurance uh, premium that comes in the fourth quarter, which is a yearly premium, but it is paid on the, on the, on the fourth quarter. So if we clean that 22% for that kind of seasonality, 
uh, we are uh, speaking of a three, approx 3% three growth no? on a quarterly basis, so analyze double digit. Uh, we, we are quite positive on the insurance side. Uh, it is not a still the main fee line, but I would estimate that the trend would be in some time, not for the, obviously for the, first, uh, for the next quarter, that it will be, if not the largest, one of the largest. It's already the third, as you can see, in terms of concepts, but it will clearly improve going, uh, going forward. Uh, the second part of the question was with regards to peaks. I gave some numbers with regard to peaks in terms of 15% market share. Uh, it is working pretty well. But let me say you, let me share with you uh, something that is uh, kind of uh, significant. No? I mean, we have, as everybody has registered, a lot of clients with all its keys, etc. But uh, we were doing on a monthly basis. Let me give you second semester, okay, from July, August, September, uh, in between. 37 to 38 million uh, tran uh, transfers per month, okay? As you know, peaks started by mid-November. I think it was 16th of November. And let me give you the numbers of December compared to what I just said. In December, we made 37.1 transfers. So absolutely in line with the number of transfers we had made in July, August, September, October, November. And we made also close to 30 million PIX transactions. So what is the bottom line of what I'm saying? That clearly we are maintaining the, the TED and DOCS, the, the transfer operations, and at the same time we are doing going into this new uh, system, With, which means at the end of the day that the link, the loyal, the capacity to transact with linked clients is even higher because we are doing what we almost more or less did and using much more the peaks capacity. And this is pure linkage. This is clients being loyal and transacting more with the bank. Okay, next question is from uh, Mario Piaje, Bank of America. What level do you think is a minimum that you would like to operate with? And what payout ratio should we expect in 21? What level of capital? Okay. Um, I would, we have always given the guidance of around 12%. I think something between 11.5% to 12%. You know that last year the payout was limited here in, in Brazil. To 30 percent. I think we, we, with the announcement we made yesterday, I think we are in 28, 29 percent. So close to the, to the in between the range. You have a minimum of 25, a maximum of 30. So we are in the, in the, in the range, in the upper part of the range, uh, last year, and that has meant that uh, we have accumulated a little bit more of, of capital. Uh, I would say that in the level of capital here. Um, between 11.5 to 12 percent, or around 12 percent, is, is uh, I wouldn't move my previous statements around around capital. Obviously, again, as the country stabilizes, this uh, level of capital is is more uh, more comfortable. No? Uh, which le which leads to the second part of your question, uh, Mario, which is uh, payout. Uh, payout. I always say the same thing. No? I mean, as you see, we are at 20 plus 21. 0.5% return on equity. Risk-weighted assets are growing at around and will be growing. My estimation or our estimation is that we'll be growing in somewhere around low double digit, 10%, 11%, 12%, which leads to an approx, approx 50% payout. No? Um, so those are the levels which, as a reference for you, with which we are working. Obviously, we will adapt depending on the on the situations, the regulation as we had last year, etc. Okay, next question is from uh, Gustavo Schroeder in Goldman Sachs. What is the bank's view regarding potential increase in solid rate and what are the impacts on NIM? Should we expect a positive impact on the bank's NIM? Okay, thank you, Gustavo. Um, 
In terms of the CELIC, uh, we have our, our macroeconomic department has an estimation that, uh, which is, I, I think, quite in line with the consensus, that CELIC will, will start to go up sometime this year from the current 2%. Uh, so uh, we will start to see movements. The, the next meeting, I think, is March, and the, and the other one is in May. And I think the, all the market has positioned itself with the increases to kind of uh, compensate the um, um, to, to, or to, to try to adapt to also to the inflation levels, etc. Uh, the the NIM sensitivity we have already communicated this several times. Uh, we are speaking of around a, a hundred million, a hundred basis points movements. Uh, it's around, I think, it's uh, two hundred or a million or something like that. Uh, in terms of, of um, sensitivity to the to the uh, to the movement of uh, interest rates, now this is sensitivity to a yield curve parallel move in the full yield curve. So the fact that the CELIC goes up or goes down, if the curve doesn't move, it doesn't move my uh, sensitivity. Okay, I think that that is important for you to to understand. So. Uh, for me, it's more important how the the yield curve moves. At the end of the day, as you know, we have been lending, we have increased significantly the lending above one year in the last uh, in the last year. So the collateralized movement also aligns with uh, with more duration in our balance set, uh, improving or not improving, increasing significantly, which also means that you have more exposure not to the very short term, but also to the to the medium part of the curve. Okay. Okay, the next question is from uh, HSBC, Carlos Gomez. Looking at the different segments, individual lending, auto, mortgage, payroll, credit cards, where are you seeing the most competition? Are you still targeting credit cards as an aerial market share growth? Um, well, I would say that we see competition across the board. I mean, uh, speaking here, if you have more or less competition, the, the, I always have said, I mean, the Brazilian market is absolutely competitive. I mean, you, are, uh, you mentioned auto. In auto, we have very strong competitors, and they are continuously, on a weekly basis, they are continuously adapting in price, in offers. Um, we are the leaders there. We have a very strong um, positioning, um, and we are increasing market share also there. But um, competition, I mean, is, is, is important. I would say that we, you will see growth in, in two parts of the balance, or more growth, not growth, more growth in two parts of the balance. One is the, uh, uh, all the collateralized part, I mean, the uh, mortgages, agro, um, the, 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 the different, uh, the, the, the auto lending, the different parts in which you see uh, uh, guarantees, payroll, etc. That is a part in which we have been growing and we will continue to to grow. Probably even linked with uh, not uh, non-collateralized like uh, consumer finance, if the country moves on a strong positive territory. Uh, that is one part. The second uh, part uh, probably would be outside the individuals uh, on the SME uh, arena. No? Corporates and large corporates, I am a little bit more conservative because specifically, obviously, uh, capital markets will, will play its, its share and it's also its competition. No? And credit cards, you mentioned, you, you were asking about credit cards. Yes, we are growing in credit cards. As you know, we stopped that growth a couple of years ago. We didn't uh, like the environment. Uh, we lose market share uh, on purpose. Uh, and uh, we are back on, 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 on growth on that part of the – and you saw the numbers, no? I mean, we, I mentioned we sold in a little bit more than two months one million credit cards on the yes cheese on the PIX offer. No? Okay, next question is from uh, Otavio Tanganay, Credit Suisse. Cost of risk is running below 2019 levels. Will there be need for additional provisions in the future? Uh, okay, Otavio, thank you. 
Um, well, the extraordinary provision we made in second queue, I have uh, continuously said that we think uh, it's uh, enough. Huh? So we are not foreseeing for the time being. Obviously, things may change, the country may change, etc. But if we continue with how we foresee the future today and with the environment that we have today, we do not foresee additional extraordinary provisions as the one we made in in second queue. Uh, in terms of uh, cost of risk evolution, etc., I already gave my my ideas there. Okay, so now we're going to receive your questions from the from phone calls. Okay. The Q and A session via telephone is open now. If you wish to ask a question via phone, please press star one. Once your query is answered, press star two to leave the line. Each participant is entitled to ask one question. If any further information is required, please re-enter the line. Our first question comes from Thiago Batista, UBS. Yeah, uh, thanks, Guy, for the for the opportunities. Uh, I have uh, one question about uh, the collection or, or or the credit recovery process. Uh, we saw a, a big uh, increase uh, in the recovery uh, during uh, 2020. Uh, I know that uh, there did some changes in this process. So if you can elaborate a little bit more on how uh, what the bank did uh, to really uh, increase uh, this uh, recovery process, and uh, if uh, the bank believes that uh, this level should continue uh, high uh, in the next uh, quarters. And a very small follow-up or a very small uh, question uh, on the taxes for next year, uh, do you have any indication on how uh, taxes should be in 21? Okay, thank you, uh, Tiago. Um, uh, yes, I, I mentioned through my presentation the recovery uh, positioning that we have been performing uh, better and better and that uh, we have uh, a clear view that is one of the important parts we had already some time ago, and we have been building, as you saw in the slide, uh, that it is one of the important parts of, on, the, on the provisioning part. Uh, what are we doing there? What we are doing is that uh, I, I, I saw it in the slide that we have been evolving uh, throughout the time in terms of how we do things on the, on the recovery side. Uh, we are focusing, what, what we do is we allocate, we do have a recovery uh, area, obviously, but it really focuses in each of the areas, in each of the segments or products, uh, to really try to optimize both the level of knowledge, the data center, etc., that we have, and the digital capacity. No? I mentioned that, I mean, recovery traditionally was made physically, as you remember. Then we started with a little bit of information. Now we are clearly on the on the digital side, no? which is it means digitalization. It means very important to integrate the distribution channels. So they have to be part of the recovery. Uh, I mentioned no, that we have 70% uh, of the digital channels that are participating already on the on the on the renegotiation, and we have also kind of innovated here. Uh, let me remember for you, for example, uh, the troca con troco, no, which is uh, on the auto side. Uh, if you have a, a car that is financed and and you want to change it for a car that is of a lower level, and in the in the exchange even obtain money. We put on the market that product. We signed an agreement with our 15,000 car dealers, and they have moved that recovery product to be one of its products. Each car dealer is offering it as it would be his or its or her product, which means that we are um, – moving our recovery capacities outside the organization, making partnership with those car dealers, uh, which is a new way of kind of recovering provisioning uh, levels. Uh, let me give you a number. 90%, 90% of the provision that has been saved through Troca con Troca, through the, that system in which we uh, subscribe with them the process, is new. We wouldn't have done it with the traditional recovery capacity. 
And that is very important, okay? Our next question comes from George Fidenham, Titbank. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me take out from the microphone here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I have one question and, and just a, a very quick follow up also, please. Uh, the question comes on the um, uh, GetNet, uh, actually, the whole card strategy. Uh, I noted that, uh, you know, cards and acquiring, even though growing 14% uh, quarter over quarter, uh, they grew only 4% year over year. And as a matter of fact, uh, it reduced 8%, uh, you know, for the last 12 months. So uh, at the same time, turnover has been quite, uh, you know, substantially growing, uh, both in, you know, uh, issuance and also in the acquiring side. So uh, just to, to understand, um, is this an effect uh, of a mix of clients uh, or it's a, an effect on, on take rates? If you could elaborate a bit more, uh, it would be helpful. And, uh, you know, the, the quick follow-up on, on the numbers, uh, I noted that this quarter we had a very uh, significant increase uh, in the contingencies uh, for civil la labor and, uh, and, and tax litigations, 120% quarter over quarter. Uh, just if you could give us uh, some color there and the, whether this is or not recurring. Thank you. Okay, let, let me. Uh, I didn't answer the tax question uh, from the from uh, from Tiago. I think it was before. So, Andre, can you elaborate on that, and then I will elaborate on both get net and contingency. I'm sorry, I forgot about you. Okay, sure. So, if I answer the uh, question uh, regarding taxes for 21, when we look our, I mean, estimates, initial estimates, and considering that we had a, already an impact of 10 months last year. And income tax increasing from 40 to 45 percent, and also considering the the results and uh, all we we can see by now, we are estimating something close in the effective tax rate to 21 from what you saw already in 20, or is slightly above. I would say it's, I mean it'll be I mean a big chance to be really close. Okay, so this is what we have. Thank you. Okay, um, on GetNet, what uh, you were mentioning. Well, I, I, I gave the numbers. Uh, depending how you take all these numbers and how you do the calculations, we will be, obviously, uh, we as you know, we, we made a, a relevant fact yesterday by which uh, management will be will have a positive opinion on the operation given to the board in the next weeks. Uh, so uh, that will also open when, whenever, if the board approves, it will open probably uh, for much more information about your your uh, your question. But uh, what I would say to you, uh, I don't know if I'm, uh, I'm answering what you mentioned, but I mean, client is growing 16%, POS are growing 38%, which means that we are penetrating much more our database and uh, turnover is growing 32%. Not not enough with that. Um, the anticipated receivables and the, the receivables business is growing close to 40%. So those numbers, and, and this is a, on a year-on-year -year basis. On a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, it depends a lot. To your question, it depends a lot on um, on the type of client. I mean, for example. If you incorporate an, a wholesale client, which is large enough, that quarter you may dilute a little bit numbers. Uh, in this quarter, in fourth queue, we were very active on Black Friday. I think I put uh, the numbers. We were leaders in the Black Friday with an amount of activity that was uh, historic. No, So uh, the, 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 the kind of volatility in between quarters it's, uh, I, would, I would really look at the year-on-year -year numbers. Uh, if you divide also by credit and debit, for example, in terms of uh, also uh, turnover, uh, we are growing in credit 15% and in, de in debit 11%. So all in all, 
the turnover is what I said, 32%, and trans transactions grow 13%, no? which shows what I said to you, if depending on the type of client that you incorporate in each of the, of the moments. The second question was about contingencies. You are right. Now, there, there is volatility in between quarters. Uh, you have, in this quarter specifically, an increase. But, I mean, depending on the quarter here, you have uh, some volatility. Give me, give, let me, I'm, I'm going to try to remember exactly the numbers. But uh, what has, if you take the last quarters, let's speak about the last five quarters, um, 2000, in the last quarter of 19, it was above 2,000, sorry, 2 billion euro, uh, reais, which has been the situation also almost in first queue. I think it was close to 2 billion. Uh, second queue was clearly above 2 billion. And what happened is that third queue was a lower amount. It was one point, I don't remember, it was 4 or 5 billion. So what is happening is that queue on queue is growing, but it is probably returning to much uh, kind of normalized or uh, common uh, levels compared to the past. If we speak specifically of contingencies there, you have three types, as you know, which are labor, uh, fiscal, and civil uh, um, contingencies. And that you do have also volatility. Specifically, I would say more on the fiscal side, because it depends if you gain something or you lose something when you have this type of, of uh, legal processes. Um, which depends on, on, the, on the quarter. It, it goes in and out. And in this quarter, we had more, a more negative performance compared to the, to the previous ones. And this is how I would explain that volatility. Our next question comes from Marcelo Telles, Credit Suisse. Hello, Angel. Uh, hello, Andrea. Uh, thanks for, for the time. Uh, most of my questions have been answered. Just to have a follow up on 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 GetNet. Um, you know, you've been uh, you know you've reached like a market share of 15%. Uh, clearly, in the past years, you know your market share has increased. And uh, wh where do we go from here? Do you still see room for for GetNet to continue to gain uh, market share? You know, given you know despite the fact you know you guys already achieved you know a very high a market share number of 15 percent and and where would that growth come from okay uh, thank you marcelo um I, I would answer to you in the in the direction that i also answered probably the, the, the same question when we were at uh, five six seven percent or even eight and there was a strong opinion in the market in the street uh, saying that okay we would reach our natural market share and that was about it because it was going to be impossible, given the, the acquiring business, to have more than our natural market share. We, we are clearly above that one. Um, and why? Because uh, we have moved the company in the direction of, as you know, the mix is more retail, two-thirds retail, depending on the moment, but around 60% retail, 40% wholesale first. Second, the cost per transaction that I said, etc. So that has made us competitive. And we have delivered or developed during the last, I would say, two, three years already, uh, additional products to the traditional only POS slash credit business. Um, so 15%, we are there. Um, it will depend, again, on the same um, matters that I mentioned to you. No, I mean, uh, would it be profitable? Would it make sense? Uh, does, that, that, do we have a space to grow? I think that the, the, the long tail, the very small part of the business in the market, this small micro uh, kind of entrepreneur, uh, is uh, we do have a space there, clearly. Uh, we should be able also on the next kind of layer, on this SME, on the small SME, okay? And then, as you know, we are, we are a bank which is quite a strong in 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 corporates bringing in payrolls. And when you bring, you not only bring in the payroll, you bring the full, or we try to bring the full range of products. And that also means acquiring. No? Those probably are the main growth areas. Uh, but again, it will depend on profitability. But uh, yes, I mean, the idea of being a, a clearly a growth company 
going forward is what we are uh, clearly seeing. It has very good competitive advantage, and it has been proved. This is a fact. This is not an estimation. So we are absolutely prepared uh, to continue on that direction, uh, if it makes sense. And the, the offering in terms of products or services is is kind of a winning uh, a winning tool. So yes. And if you add the potential operation that we announce and that we are now recommending and the board will discuss in the next uh, weeks or month or whatever it is, um, uh, well, I mean, the capacity that GetNet should have, both because of size, both on the, on the cost side and because of uh, new products and revenues, should even improve that. No? You don't have um, a kind of a global player in the acquiring business, no? So, okay, we see, I mean, that was the, the last question. So now I revert to Mr. Angel to, for the closing remarks. And thank you very much for joining us in the call. I also apologize for not taking all the questions. This time was, I mean, a big number of questions. We can obviously attend you anytime from the R team. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as Andres said, uh, if there is anything that has not been covered, please do revert to us and we will clearly answer the questions. There is, uh, there is a clear